When you get into such of a uh, of a uh, an established pattern, like I know you all are talking about the Hardy Cross method. Uh, we, oh, yeah. Yeah. I was Nodal method. I, was, I knew it was. I was. Dang it. Do this. Do this. Do that. We started Hardy Cross Friday. There is there is an analogous structural analysis method called moment distribution. The same guy came up with it. Where if you have a highly indeterminate beam, you start out fixed, fixed compute your moments, and then you successively release your fixities until all the moments cancel, like all the errors cancel to zero. He came up with it, too. He was. So, Okay, everybody, um, let's get started. Um, I, the TA told me that 2.5 and 2.6 are graded. 2.7 is being graded, but the solution should be available for 2.7. Uh, just so everybody's aware, 2.8 is due today. How did the block share homework go? All right. I had mentioned a little bit ago, I had posted the video, but I kind of forgot to make it visible until Sunday, so I'm sorry about that. Whoops. Um, but homework 2.9 is assigned today. It will actually probably be a little challenging, so I'm going to um, talk about some things about that assignment. Uh, like the actual threaded rod design part is really easy, but the structures part might take some some thinking, but it's, it's a lot of tributary area stuff, but we'll, we'll get to that here in a bit. Um, because I'm giving you the solution to homework 2.9, right after it's due, I'm not accepting any late homework for 2.9, okay, because it's going to be due at 11, I'm giving you the solution at 11, because we celebrate on Friday, okay? Sound good? And the exam's on everything up until this lecture, like including this lecture on threaded rods, so. Sound good? All right. Now today's topic is threaded rod design, but um, it is typical at this point in a steel design class to take a little bit of a discussion off to the side and talk about the high regency walkway collapse. I'm curious how many people have heard of this. I've got one or two. Anybody else heard of the walkway collapse? Okay. Is this a mall? What's that? Is it in the mall? No, it was in a hotel. It was, it was, it was in a didn't, hotel. Didn't you tell us about this? I might have mentioned it a little bit, but I don't think I ever got into the details of, of specifically what happened. Um, this, I want to talk about the, the high regency collapse. This was an event that took place uh, in the summer of 1981 at a, a hotel in Kansas City. Um, and it was a, a pretty um, uh, uh, bad structural failure. Um, over a hundred people died. Whoa, goodness. <laughs> thought I had that off. Um, over a hundred people died, um, and over 200 people were injured. And to date, this is the deadliest unintentional uh, structural failure in American history. Um, and, and I, um, I throw the word unintentional because there's obviously been events where the loss of life was more catastrophic, things like the Oklahoma City bombing and things like 9-11. Um, uh, but this one's different in the fact that it failed under its design load. Okay, to, to put that in context, has everybody heard of the Oklahoma City bombing? Everybody heard of that? It took place in the mid-90s. Um, uh, a federal building in Oklahoma City uh, was demolished by um, an IED. Um, and to, to put it in perspective, the, um, the bomb that went off in Oklahoma City, uh, what happened, it was basically like a rider van, kind of like a U-Haul that was full of explosives, and the, the van was parked literally right adjacent to the federal building, and when the bomb went off, um, the, the, I mean, the columns in the building experienced what's called a brisance failure, which basically means the steel columns shattered, okay? There was reports of broken glass and windows from the shockwave from up to a mile away. Okay? There is no way that anybody can consider that normal everyday use of the structure. That is an extreme event. Just like 9-11, that was an extreme event. That was not day-to-day -day use of the structure. That's not the case here. This was day-to-day -day use. This was normal use of the structure. Okay? And to date, this is the worst, in terms of loss of human life, the worst failure of that class uh, in American history. Now, what happened uh, during the event, uh, or what happened to cause the event, 
was a failure of, uh, I mean, obviously a structural failure, but really a failure of communication, okay? Honestly, you would be shocked at the, if you start looking at design failures and uh, uh, events that caused structural collapse, you'd be shocked at how many of them um, could be traced to poor communication uh, and, and poor decisions and not really some lack of engineering understanding. Like, how many of you have heard of the I-35 bridge collapse? Maybe you've heard of that in, in, uh, in Minnesota. Or the, 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 trust, the trust bridge that collapsed on I-35 that uh, it happened around 2007. Anybody heard of that? So there was oodles and oodles of research studies that went into behavior of trusses and behavior of connections. When it came right down to just the member being poorly designed, they made the gusset plates half as thick as they should have. That was it. I mean, it was really just poor decision. Um, what happened here was similar. Okay, so a little bit about the the, um, the, the geometry of the surroundings. So this was uh, in a hotel lobby. This is where the collapse took place. Um, and uh, if you've ever been in a hotel lobby that's uh, that's really large in a big city, I mean, they're, they're huge, right? And they tend to host events, you know, on the nights and weekends, whenever conferences come in. And there was an event taking place on a Friday evening, and it was sort of like a, like a party, like a dance party. And so the place was kind of packed, okay? Um, the building had these suspended walkways in, inside the, uh, the lobby. So there was one that was a suspended lobby on the second story and one that was a suspended lobby on the fourth story. Okay? Now, the way that they were constructed was like this. Okay? So what happened was there was a floor beam, right? Okay? and there's a threaded rod that goes from the ceiling to this fourth floor skywalk. And then there was a threaded rod that went down like this, and then there was a second threaded rod that went from the fourth floor to the um, to the second story. Okay, this was the as-built detail um, that that was actually built uh, when the when the event was or when the, the the building was constructed. But this is not how it was designed. The way that it was designed was it was supposed to be a single threaded rod that went from the ceiling all the way to the second story walkway. The contractor decided that if I, uh, instead of having a single threaded rod, if I cut it and use two threaded rods, I'll save myself about like 25 bucks a connection. And so that's what happened, okay? But from a structural mechanics perspective, what happened is that that event, that one decision, um, changed the force distribution on the floor beams. And so what happened was as the walkways were fully loaded, this threaded rod ripped right through the uh, floor beam and caused the, the walkways to collapse. And not to be super grisly about it, but what happened was both walkways fell. So this walkway fell and hit the ground, and there were people on that walkway, and then the second walkway fell on top of them. Okay, So it was a pretty grisly event. I mean, it was, it was a really, really bad day. For, for structural engineers, but I mean, hey, I mean, the contractor saved like 20 bucks a connection, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm making a point that what I, I, I want to just, I just want to like have everybody take a, a step back and recognize that there is a degree of importance to what we do uh, as civil engineers and structural engineers. There's an old joke that, you know, the difference between a, a, an engineer and a surgeon is that a surgeon can only kill people one at a time. Uh, and and I, it, it's, it's glib, but there's, a, there's some truth to it, okay? So what we do as, as engineers is really important, and I just want to make sure that we take that importance seriously throughout our, our education. That doesn't mean we can't, you know, uh, uh, relax and listen to Dr. Michelson tell cheesy puns, you know, throughout steel design, but I just want to make sure that we all recognize the importance. Yes, sir. So, instead of it being one long beam and having a nut hold the top floor, is it? One long rod. The rod. Yes. yes. The rod now has two, so the rod itself isn't holding the weight at the bottom. That one that's holding it. Yeah, it was. A, it, yeah, so so yeah. So what happened was so really what it changed was it upped the shear that that floor beam was experiencing, and so because of, of increasing that shear, it 
ripped right through. This is an image that was taken at, you know, of the collapse. This was from the forensic investigation. And you can see that the rods ripped right through because those forces were increased because they changed the distribution. So. Yes? Are there not inspections associated with the building? So what happened was this was a decision by the general contractor, right? They just didn't pick up the phone. That, that's the honest truth. They just didn't pick up the phone and call the engineer and ask, is this okay? Yeah, so. Yeah, it, it sucks. <laughs> I mean, uh, I can tell you that a lot of construction and fabrication pra practices changed as a result of this event. And I think just about everybody that touched it probably lost their license, which, you know, understandable given the severity of the event so so yeah kind of kind of um kind of a glum event to, to start a monday morning but but again i i think it's kind of important to uh just lay the context of what it is that we're doing anybody else have any other questions about the event this is definitely something that i probably if i'm being frank i probably couldn't do justice in the space of 10 minutes there's oodles of documentaries and whatnot on the event i mean this was a very serious event uh, in american history so um, there's there's oodles of info that you can find on. I might try and uh, uh, link a couple in Blackboard because this is this was a big deal. Uh, Netflix was the tar. He does a whole. He talks about this. Yeah, I'm sure, I, I, I would be shocked if he didn't because this this is one of those things that's a common case study in engineering ethics. Uh, another one like the Ford Pinto. I don't know. Was that discussed? In, in yeah. I, I talked about the Ford Pinto when I taught co-op before. So um, yeah. where where there was um, a little bit about the Ford Pinto. So uh, anybody that's ever heard of Ford Pintos, there was a, um, uh, a, a, an association with them exploding because they did. Under rear end collisions, they had a tendency to explode. And what happened was Ford did a cost benefit analysis. And what they did is on one end, they said in order to remedy the situation, they needed uh, like an, uh, a steel plate installed in the car that was like $11 for material and installation. And so they multiplied that by the number of vehicles that were out there and they got a number. And then on the other end, they said, well, we're probably going to lose about 200 people a year and 200 people a year for all the lawsuits that we're going to have to uh, uh, incur as those of those, um, those deaths, we're probably going to have to pay X number of dollars per lawsuit because people are going to sue us. And they found that it was actually cheaper to pay the lawsuits than it was to fix the problem, and so they didn't fix the problem. I, I kid you not. Like, I mean, this is, the, this is the honest truth. In fact, what happened was back in the 70s, a whistleblower leaked the memo from the NTSB study. That sh I mean, it's right there. They said, here's how much we're going to have to pay for wrongful death. This is how much we're going to have to pay for injury and versus how much we're going to have to pay to fix the problem. They said we're not going to fix the problem. Yeah, that's, yeah. So it's kind of bleak for Monday morning, isn't it? Let's get back to some steel design. Let's talk about steel design. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about threaded rods. Um, so you've probably seen threaded rods in, um, in some, you know, structural installations. A, a common use of them are for tie rods, for lateral supports, for what I would call shallow structures or structures that aren't very tall buildings. Um, they can be used as sag rods for pre preventing excessive deflections, but they're also commonly used uh, as bracing elements. Now, um, one of the things about threaded rods is that unlike like a normal tension member that has gross section yielding, neck section fracture, block shear rupture, and all that stuff, Threaded rods are really only governed by one limit state, and that's tensile rupture of where the threads are, okay? Now, some commonly available diameters, because uh, uh, that, this box here on the slide is kind of important, because what's going to happen is um, we're going to do some math, and we're going to get a dB equals 0 0.68 inches, and we're going to say, okay, you're not going to tell somebody to... Um, use a threaded rod that is 0 0.68 inches, you're going to say something like use a three-quarter inch diameter rod. Okay, So threaded rods or, or bar stock is commonly available in eighth of an inch increments from a quarter of an inch to one and a quarter, 
Once you get past one and a quarter, they're available in quarter inch increments, normally. That, those are about the, the bar diameters that you can expect. Now I can tell you on an exam, if you are getting the right minimum bar diameter and you just happen to pick one size too high, too high I'm not really so much gonna worry about that. Um, I'm really just interested that you're computing the right DD men, uh, but we'll get to that here in a bit and you'll see what I mean. Now, if you go into the manual, um, you will find that uh, the AISC specifications that refer to threaded rods are in chapter J, okay? Because a threaded rod from, a, from an AISC specification standpoint is more, uh, is more closely aligned with sort of a bolt intention than it is a tension member. So that's why you'll find it in the bolt section of the manual. And I'll, I'll say a couple things before we get into the, um, the, 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 the nitty gritty details. So first off, we are going to be spending a fair amount of time in Chapter J. We've already dipped our toes into Chapter J a little bit because we talked about block shear, and we're already talking about Chapter J when we're talking about uh, uh, high strength bolts and tension. We're going to spend a lot of time in Chapter J, so I do want to give you a, um, a little bit of uh, a warning on that. The other thing I will tell you is that sometimes specifications can feel like you're, you're on a scavenger hunt because you'll be in a section of a specification and then it will refer to something else and so you have to turn from page to page to page and, and I just sort of want to say now that that's just kind of how it is uh, and you sort of need to like accept that and deal with it because again this, the specifications are organized as generally as possible to apply to as broad of a range uh, of situations uh, 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 as possible. So sometimes for your problem, for your design situation, you have to look up something in this guide and then go over to this section and then go over to this table. So that's just kind of the nature of the, the, the beast with this stuff. Okay. Now, in order to uh, design a high strength bolt, the nominal capacity is some limiting stress times AB. Now, uh, AB, that's the nominal capacity. Uh, AB is just the nominal unthreaded area of the bolt. So if we're talking about a three quarter inch diameter bolt, then AB is pi B squared over four, or pi R squared. That's the actual area of the bolt. Uh, FN is either the nominal tensile stress or the nominal shear stress. So this equation is used not only for bolts that you are loading in tension, but also bolts that you are shearing. So it's the same, uh, it's the same equation. We just use different limiting stresses. And we get these limiting stresses from table J32. So if you turn to table J32, this is what table J32 looks like. Um, I'm cutting out some of the table because table J32 is a big table. It crosses the entire page. It's on 16.1-129. Uh, it should be on the right page. Does everybody see that? So we're going to be looking at this table again uh, a little bit later um, when we go into exam two land. But suffice it to say that what this table will do is it will outline the tensile strength and the shear strength of a given connector based on various uh, situations. So at the very top of the table, you'll see things like group A bolts when threads are not excluded and group A bolts when threads are excluded. And then the same thing for group B and, and et cetera. Okay, we're not talking about bolts right now. So we're just talking about threaded rods uh, uh, for tension members. So if you go to the very bottom, what it says is um, threaded parts meeting the requirements of such and such when, threaded rod, when threads are not excluded. And then the same thing where it says threads are excluded. But what you'll find is that if you look at the tensile strength, the tensile strength is not affected by this statement here because we're not taking a rod and placing it in shear, we're placing it in tension. What this statement about threads being excluded or not excluded from the shear plane is, what it's saying is, is if you have a, a, a threaded part, some of it's going to be threaded and some of it's going to be not, right? So let's say here's what your threads look like. The question about the shear plane is if I'm taking this bolt or this threaded part and I'm shearing it in half, am I shearing it here or am I shearing it here? And dependent upon whether or not I apply my shear, I'm going to get a different shear strength. But it's not going to have any effect on what the tensile strength is. Does that make sense? 
So that's why you'll find that for any one of these columns, this number is the same for the same category, regardless of the shear planes. And what we're saying for threaded parts that aren't bolts is that the tensile strength is 75% of FU. And that 75% of FU is accounting for the reduction in strength because of the threads, right? Because what you're doing when you have a threaded part is you're taking a solid part and you're cutting the threads into it, right? It's like a tap and die, whenever you use a tap and die. So whenever you use a tap and die, you're cutting threads into a, a circular part, so you're removing area. You're making the area smaller. It is a smaller area here than it is here. So regardless of whether or not uh, you have a shear plane, you are cutting area out, so we account for that reduction by just saying 75% uh, of FU. So if here's our equation, VRN is V, FN, T, A, B, we can make our life a little easier by doing a little bit of algebra. So V is 0.75, which I'll just call that three quarters. Um, FNT, that's 0.75 FU, so that's also three quarters FU. I'm doing a lot of fractions here because you're going to see the equation at the end becomes pretty easy to deal with. And then the area of the bar is pi over 4 D squared. And so if I combine all this, so V, FNT, AB, collect all this, I get this. So what I can tell you is how strong a threaded rod is as a function of its diameter and the material that I'm using. It's a really simple equation, okay? So if I have a really, really simple equation, I can take that equation and rearrange it and determine what is the required diameter under a given load, and I can do design in a matter of seconds. So I'll let everybody get a sec, because I see some people uh, chugging this down. I want to show you the next slide, because the next slide is the one that's really important. All right. Everybody got this? So, so what I'm doing here is if we have a very well-contained expression for VRN, so VRN is the capacity, it equals this. If I want to design, just set that equal to the load and solve for the diameter. So 64 over 9 pi, put FU on the bottom, take the square root. So I take the square root of this expression here, the 64 over 9, those are perfect squares, so I can factor that out and set a 64 over 9, I have 8 over 3. So I have a really nice, pretty plug and chug expression where given some load, I can solve for the required uh, bar diameter in a matter of, you know, seconds. So design of threaded rods is pretty easy, okay? What you gotta do is you gotta determine the factored load on that rod, compute DD min, select the rod diameter. That's it, okay? So how to make these problems um, intricate or involved for you as students is to go back to doing some structural analysis. So let's take a look at that. Oh, one other thing. Sorry, I forgot about this. Are there any limits on slenderness? No, because if you go back to the manual, it says that our L over R slenderness limit does not apply to rods or hangers in tension. Threaded rods are inherently slender. They are, they are designed to be slender. So it's okay to use elements that by the L over R. That, that's okay. So, so, forgot about that. <coughs> All right, so here's our problem for today. We are going to design the most economical threaded rod as a diagonal brace for this frame or this, this uh, component shown. All right, so let me pull up the <coughs> So we have a frame or, an ele or a truss element. This is uh, 15 foot tall, 20 foot wide. Um, I have a diagonal threaded rod right here that I'm going to be designing. Um, and I know that over here at the top, I'm applying a lateral load. The load is 3,000 pounds of dead load and 7,000 pounds of live load. So if I wanted to start out right now, just to keep this simple, we'll do that three kips. 
So what do we get for this? 1.2 times 3 plus 1.6 times 7. <clears throat> Got 14.8. 14.8 kips. Do I have a second on that? Now, okay, now our design expression for threaded bars is this. Okay? Now, we know that this is A36 steel, so for A36 steel, what is FU? 58. 58. So, so does that mean that I just put 58 here and 14.8 here and chug an answer out? No. Absolutely not. Okay? Because, let's take a step back. This 14.8 that I just computed, this is the factored load here. But my question to you, if I put 14.8 kips here, do I get 14.8 kips inside this element here? I have no idea because in order to answer that question, what do I need to do? I need to do some structural analysis. So now, let's go back to CE 312 and do some structural analysis. So, what does that mean? This is a truss, right? A truss. Looks like this. We have a diagonal element that looks like that. We have a lateral load applied right here, and we know the magnitude of that load. That is 14.8 kips. We know that this dimension here is 15 feet. We know that this dimension here is 20 feet. Problem statement told us to assume that the left support is a pin and the right support is a roller. Right? So we know that this here is at a 3 to 4 slope ratio. Right? And let's, let's do some naming here. This is support A. Is that slope ratio back here? Yes, it is. I'm glad that you are watching out for me. So I, I think that's about a point two on the mistake counter, but we haven't had many. Oh, that's a mistake. mistake. That would have turned into a big mistake. That would have, but we caught it. <laughs> I could have left it. That's on you. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, okay, so let's call this support A. Let's call this support B. All right, let's go back to my CE312 land. So this is a roller. How many unknown reactions do I have in a roller? <clears throat> One. Let's assume that's upward. We have a vertical reaction here and a horizontal reaction here. Call this AX, right? <clears throat> now, I have three equations of equilibrium, the sum of forces in the x-direction, sum of forces in the y-direction, sum of moments. Anybody tell me one that we can go ahead and apply right now? Moments. We could do moments. Let's go ahead and do moments. So we will sum moments where? A. A. So we'll sum moments at A. I have 14.8 at a moment arm of what? What's the moment arm for this force here? 15. 15, right? On the left column, what goes in the right column? By. By times what? There we go. All right? 
So 14.8 times 15. Two twenty-two equals by times twenty feet. So by is positive. I think mental math tells me that's eleven point one. So eleven point one kips going upwards. All right. What's next? Sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction. I'm surprised nobody did sum of forces in the x direction first, because we got how many unknowns? One. We just, in the x direction, we only have one. We just have ax, right? So if we sum forces in the x direction, the only thing we have is ax here and 14.8 here. So. AX is positive 14.8 kips, 14.8 kips to the left. <clears throat> Bring it back, isn't it? I'm sure some of you are like, we had this last semester, Dr. Mike. That's over. I mean, you didn't expect us to have to do that again this semester, did you? There's some people who are like, yeah, we're, we're actually thinking that. <laughs> All right. Sum of forces in the y direction. We don't have a problem with this one, aren't we? Because we on our free body diagram, we have AY drawn up and we have BY drawn up. BY we know, though. That's 11.1 .1 going up. So AY plus 11.1 kips is zero. Therefore, AY is minus 11.1 kips. Remember, if we get a negative answer, it doesn't mean we need to develop significant emotional distress. It just means that our assumed direction was incorrect, but that's okay. It just means that it's acting downwards. It's like all that stuff we did last semester was important or something. So far, so good? Now, if I want to find the force inside this diagonal element, you tell me what to do now. Method of joints. Method of joints. Analyzing which joint? A. Let's analyze joint A. All right, so... So here's the joint. Remember, like this. Um, remember, like that. Now, we got to be careful on our labeling here because we have a horizontal force here of 14.8 kips, but the vertical reaction is not upwards, it's down because we assumed incorrectly. That's okay. So this is AY going up, but we got a negative answer, so that's going down. Okay. Now, we've got an unknown here, and then an unknown here, and an unknown here. We'll assume that's in tension. Okay. Assume this one's in tension too. Okay. Don't forget, 3 and 4. And I'll label that correctly this time. Can't add another point to the mistake count. Okay. So I've got two unknowns in the vertical, one in the horizontal. What should I do? Solve for the forces in the x direction first. That's correct. So if I sum forces in the x direction, all right, so if I have 14.8 going to the left, what is this? 14.8 going to the right. So we'll just call that, I don't know, Fx. And then the slope ratio tells us that Fy equals some fraction times Fx. What is that fraction? Four 
Four thirds, because, well, wait, 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 hold on. We've got the horizontal component, we're looking for the vertical component. The vertical component's gonna be smaller. Three fourths. The vertical component is smaller, so the fraction has to be smaller than one. So, all right, what is that? 11.1. Going up. Now, if we wanted, we could go ahead and solve for this vertical member. Is there really any reason to? I don't really care what it is because I'm trying to decide this thread broad. I've got the X and Y component. So therefore, what is the force in the thread rod? Right. How do I determine that? Pythagorean theorem. So I take What do I get for this? The 18.5 kips. Do I have a second? Yeah. <clears throat> that is what we're designing this threaded rod for. Not the 14.8 at the beginning of the problem, but that. Okay? That's the load. So now what we can do is we can say. This is this, 58 KSI. So what's our minimum bar diameter? And let's let's get a little crazy. Let's do like four decimal places. And there, there's a reason why. is listed in uh, in what diameters, what increments? Eighth, eighth. eighth of an inch, right? So if we do something like 5 eighths, that's what, 0 0.625? 6 eighths or 3 quarters is 0 0.75, right? 7 eighths is 0 0.875, like 8 eighths, that's just 1. So... What diameter rod should we be using for this application? Seven eighths inch diameter bar. So use a seven eighths inch diameter rod. So if you see that fee value used in a sentence, that's what it's basically indicating is a rod diameter. Okay. All right. We're not done just yet because I want to talk about your homework assignment. And I'm going to give you some hints on homework assignment to help you out. But before we move on, does this make sense? Okay, and the big thing is that I want you to recognize that 
just because you factor the load. And this is true with the threaded rod, but really it's true of any tension member or any structural design for that matter, is there is a difference between factoring the loads and then doing the structural analysis to figure out how much load is actually on the element that we are designing, okay? Does that make sense? So make sure that you're not just factoring the loads and plugging it in. So I can tell you right now, if we had, so think about this. Imagine if we had just taken this 14.8 and plugged it into here. What would we have gotten if we had taken 14.8 here instead of 18.5? I'm asking. 7.599 So there's a good chance we had selected an undersized rod, right? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we would have gotten lucky. But I don't know about you, but I really don't want to count on luck. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, all right. Okay. So here's your homework assignment. And I want to talk a little bit about it because this one's going to be a little bit on the trick side. All right. So I want you to design threaded rods for this suspended walkway. Okay. So probably a guess why I'm doing this assignment, right? I mean, probably. Okay, so the walkway is six foot wide and the threaded rods are spaced 20 foot longitudinally along the walkway, okay? Now, I tell you here about what's going on here about the loads. So I say that the dead load consists of a concrete slab that's four and a half inches thick, okay? Now assume that the concrete weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot, and then I say that the walkway will be subjected to a 100 pounds per square foot live load, okay? All right, so that, that 100 pounds per square foot live load, that's the people on the walkway, okay? Now I want you to use tributary area to distribute the load to each rod, and then I ask you a second hint, what is the volume of concrete each rod is required to resist? And I say watch your units. So let me kind of explain what I mean by that, all right? So, okay, so hence for homework 2.9, okay? So if you go back to this statement here, I say the walkway is six foot wide and the threaded rods are spaced 20 feet longitudinally, okay? So what that means is that this dimension here is six feet, okay? This dimension from here to here and from here to here and from here to here is 20 feet, okay? So every 20 feet there's a rock, okay? So, So this is the walkway, okay? So this is me in the helicopter looking down like this, okay? So what I'm going to see is I'm going to see the walkway surface, and then I'm going to see threaded rods sticking out like that. D does that make sense? Okay, and then... Each, longitudinal spacing is 20 feet. So what is the tributary area of a rod? Let's say this rod. What's the tributary area? Well, if I remember from CE 312 structural analysis, tributary area as defined as the area that is how far between adjacent elements? Halfway. halfway. So maybe halfway to this rod, halfway to this rod, halfway to these rods, and maybe the tributary area for... That threaded rod is that area right there. 
And maybe a tributary area times a pressure load. I don't know, maybe that gives you a live load on the system or on the rod. Make sense? Now here's another one. Here's another hint for you. All right, you were told in the problem statement that concrete weighs, or reinforced concrete weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot, right? That is, per unit volume, that is how heavy the concrete is. So, the total weight of the concrete, or I don't know, the dead load maybe, is the unit weight times the volume, right? Now, what is the volume of concrete per threaded rod? The tributary area times depth. The tributary area times the depth or the thickness, right? Either, either one. So, And the only thing I will say, and I'm not saying any more, here, let's, let's rewrite that as capital T. This is in square feet, and this is in inches. So you have to handle those units appropriately. Because keep in mind that this is in pounds per cubic feet. I ain't saying any more. Does that make sense? All right, does anybody have any questions? All right, one thing I will say before I let you go. This is it for exam one. This is exam one. From here, no more. So Wednesday we come in, Wednesday we do our exam reviews like you've done and I don't know how many different Dr. Mike classes you've had where we have a couple minutes where we talk about the format and then I'll let you ask whatever you want. We celebrate on Friday. That's all I have everybody. We'll see you all.